the Catholic religious doctrine, and number two, how does this beneficially impact the Catholic Church itself and its followers? So on to the first clash about whether or not this is an appropriate amendment of the religious doctrine in the Catholic Church, Mr. Speaker. We told you several things. First of all, that there's an inherent value in things like familial love and reproduction, right? This is closely intertwined with the various core doctrines of the Catholic Church, and it's, there is no reason why the clergy and the priests should necessarily be exempt from that. We then told you that religious doctrine is malleable and should evolve based on social discourse because the followers are ultimately becoming more progressive. The Pope also has certain progressive tendencies that he has demonstrated through past amendments and uh, like declarations, right? The only thing that opposition comes up and tells us is that the characteristic of the Catholic Church is that it relies on central authority and somehow that precludes all the analysis we provided as to why religious doctrine can continuously evolve. We told you and they admitted that these amendments are entirely possible, right? The characteristic is that Catholic Church is indeed a strong community. This is very different from saying that modifying the community values is going to make a community necessarily weaker, right? We think that the Catholic Church can still maintain its solidarity while trying to evolve to social trends. We, in fact, want to con counter their argument saying that if they don't take into consideration social discourse and various progressive movements that are going on, even among the follower base, then we think that it will become much less attractive to currently progressive followers, such as young followers or people yeah, who are new yeah. to the Catholic Church, right? This is a harm that they never take into consideration. But furthermore, the very idea that the Catholic Church relies on central authority is precisely what we told you in our last argument, that the yeah, Pope's yeah. board has authority within the Church, and that's why individuals will want to listen to the Pope, even if they might personally disagree, we think that they will still be willing to adapt to the Church's evolving values. So that's why we think that this is indeed an appropriate modification of the Catholic Church's religious doctrine, because based on precedent, it has already been happening for the past few years, and we believe that this is a healthy phenomenon that doesn't necessarily damage the entire integrity of the Catholic Church. But on to the second clash about the more practical impacts that this would have on the church and the followers, as well as the priests themselves. We told you on side government, Mr. Speaker, that the trend of the status quo is to demonstrate progressive interpretation of strict religious doctrines, right? In fact, not yeah. doing so is contravening the status quo in which the Pope has already declared that abortion is not necessarily a sin, that being gay is not something you need to apologize for, right? We think that in fact, not acknowledging that trend runs the risk of losing relevance within the religious yeah, community, yeah. that you have to improve the tractability of being a priest or being a follower to those who are new to the community. There was absolutely no engagement coming from side opposition as this practical harm that we clearly elaborated in our second argument. Side opposition comes up and tells us that this is only for followers, that the Pope somehow only has jurisdiction over their followers, not necessarily the priests. We want to tell you that this is simply untrue, right? Yeah, the yeah. Pope writes and affects the entirety of the religious community, not just the followers. In fact, gay people, for instance, when the Pope says that gay, being gay is not wrong, that being gay is not a sin, it affects gay priests as well. When the Pope says that purgatory doesn't exist, it also influences individuals of the priest community within the clergy yeah, yeah. who seek purgatory as well. So all of the things that the Pope says clearly impacts not only the followers, but also the individuals who lead the followers, who lead these religious communities. Their second argument told you that this is going to weaken the Catholic Church because priests will see that their values are demeaned. The reason why they joined the church will be undermined. Number one, we don't think that the reason why priests joined the church is necessarily because of this one specific here, doctrine here. of disallowing marriage. But second of all, we simply disagree with the characterization that the Jesuit branch in which the Pope belongs is a minority party, right? When the Pope visits a certain country, thousands and millions of people here, here. come out of the streets to listen to what he's saying and to accept and integrate those doctrines into their religious lifestyles, right? So once we assess the likelihood of extremely conservative individuals leaving a church which we think is unlikely to begin with versus the likelihood of progressive individuals who are currently beginning to enter the church and beginning to accept its values, we think that it's far more beneficial to target the latter because that's already the majority of the church followers' composition, right? They also told you that the Pope will eventually change, so it'll make no difference in the future. Yes, we agree that the Pope will change, and sometimes that might abandon some of the progressive beliefs that he promoted during his like during his service, right? But if the amendments were so bad, if that actually lost the support of the Catholic followers, then we think that the Catholic Church will correspond to that and not allow those amendments amendments in the future. But because we see that the status quo and the trend and the progressive trend of the status quo is so beneficial, we think it's unlikely that the Pope's decisions will be completely reversed in the future as well. This there is simply a disingenuous characterization of what's actually going on. Moving on to our third argument, Mr. Speaker, about why this is, or fourth argument, why it's better for priests to set an example of leading a family for their entire community. Mr. Speaker, much like how precedents in the status quo have families and are valued for being family men, 
we think priests also have the same capacity to serve that same role, right? Because the role of priests currently is to guide the spiritual lives of the community members, to organize things like soup kitchens, to demonstrate benevolence to the followers of that religion. Ultimately, their role is to set an example for fellow citizens to follow in practical, real life, right? We think this is far more important than following precisely what religious doctrine dictates, or precisely what Christ practiced, because priesthood serves a practical role for the religious community. So what benefits will having a spouse and a family of the priest bring? One, we think that this sets an example for how to lead a religious family life, right? Yeah, There's yeah. an expectation that the priest family and spouse will become a model family. So when it comes to things like how to respectfully treat your wife or how to religiously educate your children, we think they will be able to set a clear example for the community to follow. But second of all, we also think that this will practically allow them to delegate certain religious tasks and become far more involved in the community and with the followers. They can serve multiple roles, right? It's not just you being a priest. You can become a parent. You can get involved in education. You can go to the child's school and talk about like your social issues with other individuals who belong to that religious community as well. Ultimately, you become more well-rounded about different aspects of your followers and of your follower base. We think that that's a good thing for religion because ultimately religion is all about the connection between the priest and the followers, how much, how much they trust each other, how much religious connection they maintain. But our fourth argument, Mr. Speaker, is about how this is going to discourage unhealthy phenomena like sexual abuse in the clergy. Number one, we think that this decreases or increases opportunity for sexual expression, right? In the status quo, everything sexual has to be hidden. There is no here, continuous here. partner with whom you can maintain a relationship. This makes you much more willing to have sex with people who can easily be silenced, right? We think that's the root of all crimes that are happening. But second of all, the reason why we think that the likelihood of these crimes is going to decrease under our policy is that there will be family policing in which wives and children here, here. become an intimate partner of the family, and if they do decide to morally digress, it's much easier to hold them accountable. For all of these benefits and religious reasons, we're very proud to propose. Thanks, DPM. I now call on the Deputy Leader of Opposition. They do not have any uh, wants to protect other than uh, because they do not have any enemy from the start. We think when it comes down to a matter of sexual assault, this is not a mutually exclusive problem that actually problem within the society because we see. But at the same time, we allowing this priest to actually marry and have a certain family doesn't necessarily solve the problem at the end of the day because we believe that cause more problem in terms of the bank uh, or corruptions within the religion, which would be my third argument. But before that, let me move on to entire rebuttals of, upon the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister because we believe their characterization regarding the Catholic Church is very wrong from this yeah. Number one, they say somehow reproductional value. Okay, Catholic Church are the ones who are banning the abortion from the start. We, they value and they, they celebrate those people who are creating family. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that priests are actually bad, like priests having a certain model family need to or making people to have more marriage because that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a more moral family. The priest in itself and Catholicism in itself is celebrating the values based upon the love and based upon the value of the Holy Spirit. We agree. But the, the a lot of you know a lot of uh, a lot of learners from the Jesus, the twelve learners from the Jesus are over already married. We tell you the doctrines coming from the Bible doesn't necessarily say that you should not marry from the start. So we believe your Catholic is not banning uh, is banning abortion. Catholics and celebrate Catholics value necessarily celebrates the marriage and the family at the end of the day. So we making a certain portion of this like priest to be married within a certain region doesn't necessarily guarantee or change anything but backlashes which will be followed. Uh, no thank you. Religions and discourses can be changed. Number one, Holy Script never said that that you should not marry as a priest. As I told you, the twelve yes, twelve people within the like uh, twelve learners from the Jesus actually married a lot. The fact that they banned from the central land system met like the priests from marrying is because of private properties and, and uh, commercializations of the religion that 
that frequently happens within the protest Protestants and Japanese Buddhism. We tell you that's actually bad for the capitalism at the end of the day because your centralized power will be significantly decreased, but at the same time, your power will be privatized within your family. We think that that will be liberated, which should be they cannot actually be at the end of the day. We think that this is not a holy Bible banning priests to not marry anyways. We think religions and discourses can be changed, but the, but the fact that the backlashes that happens upon the priest community will be so much severe, we think that their characterization is very, very untrue. Third of all, Pope, Pope, Francis, Pope Francis is a pro progressive one. They fight for LGBT, they fight for abortions are not always bad. Number one, we tell you this amendment and emotion is not necessarily about believers, it's about themselves, priests and community. We think that the level of the backlashes will be significantly different. But at the same time, your discriminations upon the LGBT and abortion is not necessarily a discrimination when it comes down to matter of your choice of marriage. If you do not want to have a marriage, you don't have to marry. If you want to marry, just get out of the community. Maybe be a church or Protestants. We don't necessarily see that you not marry is a discrimination that has to be based upon the progressive movement as a claim. We think as a, as a consensus that you have understanding of education, that you follow a doctrine within your whole life, we think that necessarily them changing is not a, like is not a based upon the progressive movement at the end of the day. No thank you. Secondly is the solidarity will not be weakened. Number one, in two us number two uh, like for the two reasons we tell you yes it will be. Number one, political momentums that currently Jesus I uh, like Pope Pope is currently in is a Jesuit society. In other words, the characterizations coming from our literal opposition already told you why this is so much bad because the political momentum is significantly weakened, weaker compared to any other major political party. Uh, not political party, but community. Secondly, we think that amendments can up, upon the priest is significantly different from what you can tell to the believers because the significance between the centralized system and you're the ones who are stakeholder within the system. We think that there has to be the very a lot of confusions between different branches, but at the same time your whole educations and doctrines will have to be amended. We think the division in itself is causing more community problem, leading to much more backlashes and solidarity, which is not actually good for the community or Catholic Church in itself because that necessarily hurts the solidarity, not just because of the believers, but at the same time the centralized system with it itself will be significantly so, harmed and blamed. No, thank you. In terms of the amendments of the doctrine, decreases the amendments, uh, the amendment of the, when amendment of the doctrines decrease the number of the believers, they suddenly claim that in the future the church might not be, might not want to change anymore. Number one, why would they then have to risk from the start, they, they, have to have the, they would have to go through a certain amount of sure. amendments, when they already guarantee that amendment of a certain doctrine can cause a decrease of the number of the believers. We think that the confusions within the community, but at the same time confusions within the believers are also very detrimental at the end of the day. Secondly, we think that what happens for the Pope and this community when every, every time the new Pope is being Nominated, we think that the political uh, political agenda and political infringement upon that you should follow a certain doctrine because I'm the Pope. Furthermore, is a more morality problem. Is not the is leading political politicizations of the, within the Catholic Church You're causing right. more problems within the division. Yes. Like for the last time, we're not forcing them to marry. So why would these priests leave Catholic Church when they can just choose not to marry? When the reason why they become priests is not because they are disallowed from marriage. Because some priests are now marrying and making family, but at the same time, within your doctrines and within your branch, you are banned to do so. We think that that insect inconsistency within the branch is causing more divisions, which is actually a proposition never, never succeeded to engage from the start. Finally, I'm going to tell you why corruptions of the bishops and priests would be much more likely happen within our site. The reason why in the medieval period Europe, the Catholic Church banned the priests from marrying is because of the privatizations of the church and private property of the, of the church being successive to the, to the descendants. This is very important because now you having a family or son or daughter, this daughter necessarily means that you have something more important than your doctrine and your God. We think that this, this, is, this corruption is frequently happening in terms, in terms or in cases of the Japanese Buddhist or in cases of the Protestants, when they are capable of creating their own church and because of the fact that they have something more important than the doctrines and God in itself, now it's possible for them to have a privatized power. We think that that is the main reason why, just right after the Crusader War, the entire entire Catholic Church or community has banned individuals from marrying furthermore because the centralized system in itself is the most powerful and efficient way of cleansing further corruption that might happen in the future. We think that two aspects can happen. Ah, okay. For these reasons, we tell you there's a primary 
only reason why the centralized system of the Catholic power is much more significantly consistent and important and at the same time very powerful in terms of keeping their believers from the start because that's very different from inter various interpretations of the Protestants at the end of the day. But at the same time, we also told you why individuals of the priests have much less incentive and powerful checks and balances in terms of the preventing the corruptions because the privatizations of the power was very, very prevalent, which is already prevalent in the cases of the Protestants and Japanese Buddhism. Thank you. Thanks, DLO. I now call on government whip. Mr. Speaker, this is one of the few moments in my life that I'm particularly happy of my three decades of Catholic education. <laughs> one of the rare moments. Okay. <laughs> there are two issues that I actually want to talk to you about in today's debate. But before I move on, let me just go back to what the problem that we set out quite clearly the onset of the debate. John talked about the idea of existence of clerical abuses. First Speaker Jun Jing talked about the idea of the existence of declining numbers, ladies and gentlemen, declining number of priests largely because they're being lost to other um, religious denominations like Baptists, for example, and um, you know, and, uh, and the Protestants. So the question is, how are we supposed to address this thing? And the thing is that negative bench was largely silent about yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah. So we were practically begging them to respond and say, what is the best thing for Pope Francis to actually address these things? Well, let's move on to the two issues. Firstly, it's about the declining number of members of the Catholic Church as well as the declining number of priests. We talked to you about the idea that Pope Francis already recognizes that the world is changing. There's a lowering number of members in Europe and the United States, and generally in progressive parts of the world. So that's the reason why Pope Francis issued economic letters to move them back, showing progressiveness. Things like, for example, assailing purgatory, all types of decays, and saying that you know, abortion is not actually sin. These are things that Jinping already talked to you about yeah, a yeah. while ago. The response coming from the negative bench is to say simply that these are policies with respect